Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for jumping up this morning. I don't know about you guys. A friend of mine the other day was kind of ribbing me about being um, glass half full because I was a little half empty that day. And while I don't really enjoy that comment from people, but it's true at times, this morning, I don't know about you all, but you wake up, you come in, the sun is rising, blue sky, little frost, and Robert Plant's In the Mood was on the radio, Sirius XM Radio. I love that song. So I thought, it's going to be a good day today. Yeah. Anyway, uh, before we get started, will you uh, join me in a quick Pledge of Allegiance, please? Get our flag over here. Awesome. Thank you all. So this morning we have, uh, as you can tell, we have four speakers up front here. Um, each speaker is going to have 20, 30 minutes to kind of give a quick presentation, an opportunity for some uh, Q&A. Um, and we're going to start out uh, with Bill Ricky, and then I'll, I'll kind of go through this real quick, and then we'll start out with you, Bill. Bill is one of our active members here at the Chamber. Um, interestingly, volunteered for the Revenue Task Force, which uh, is a big commit, I think. Uh, it, it was nothing I was going to jump up for, so I appreciate him doing that. Um, and then next will be Nicole Pometeer Hazelbaker, uh, founder of Bravio Communications, uh, also the lobbyist for the chamber, and she's going to give us some quick updates and hopefully talk about the Christmas tree bill a little bit uh, that I think passed, but she'll talk about it. I don't want to steal that thunder. And then uh, immediately to my left, Andrea Castaneda, who is the superintendent for the Salem-Kaiser School District. Um, she has not had her hands full. I don't think anyone really knows what's happening on, so she'll be able to shed some light on some of those things for us. And then we'll finish up with Jimmy Jones, who's the executive director of Community Action Agency right down the street and all the things that they work on. Um, in fact, I don't think many people really know everything that they work on. So hopefully Jimmy will be able to talk about all those good things that they work on. So with that, uh, panelists, thank you very much for being here. And Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you um, regarding the Revenue Task Force. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for hosting me this morning. Um, it's good to see everybody. So I don't have a whole heck of a lot to report. We've had two meetings and uh, there hasn't been a whole heck of a lot of progress made. Uh, what's been really uh, interesting about being on this task force is the, the the folks that I'm on it with are very passionate and care about Salem. Uh, you can tell by the questions that they're asking that they uh, they care about the greater good of the town and, and want what's best. Um, with that being said, we got within the last 10 minutes of the last meeting, we got the, the proposed um, options to generate revenue that the city has ideas of. Uh, at that time, when they gave us this list, uh, they also asked us to submit our ideas that uh, may be different than this. Th this is all stuff that's going to just cost us money uh, as citizens in Salem. So, you know, the, the bicycle registration fee, uh, business gross tax receipts, uh, construction excise tax, uh, tax, corporate income tax, electric vehicle charge station permit fees, first responder fees, franchise fees. Uh, there's 41 of them. The one that I was most interested in uh, because I, it, it kind of, to me, um, crosses the boundary the city wants us to adhere to a, a revenue task force versus the budget committee. They don't want any interaction there. I actually asked their first meeting if the two two groups could meet to, to brainstorm ideas together. Um, and um, Moss Adams wasn't um, opposed to that, but every city employee that was there that night, uh, you could tell by their facial expressions, they didn't want that to happen. Uh, but they, they do have in here one, one way to generate revenue is to uh, sell surplus property. So I thought that that, um, that was positive. They give us an opportunity to maybe cross that boundary a little bit, which I think would be important. For those of you, I think we all here own businesses, you know, at the end of my fiscal year, which just ended January 31st, first thing I do is I get on my P&L. Okay, where can I cut for the next year to be profitable? And also, where can I generate more revenue? So you put that together, and that's how you're successful. Uh, I don't know that the city should be that much different, but right right now we are. So um, that that's kind of the, the end of that so far, just having those two meetings. You know, I got to tell you, 
the, the first hour of the very first meeting was a meet and greet, and then we took a 20-minute break. So if you have an idea sometimes why government doesn't work, that's why. Um, but, you know, I will say this, even being hard on the city a little bit, um, the city staff that's there with us in the evenings, you know, they're, we're there from 6 to 9 in the evenings. I think those people are mostly salary um, paid employees. So, you know, they're dedicated as well. We may view the world differently, but... Uh, I got to hand it to at least they're there and willing to answer the questions that the task force has of them. So um, if you have any questions thus far of me, I, I'm willing to answer them, but there's not a whole heck of a lot to uh, to speak about. Roger. Did you talk about annexing more uh, properties that were that, tangential to the city? Yeah, that question has been asked uh, with no answer yet. Working off of, uh, is there a specific revenue target that they're working off of? Is it like a percentage of city budget? And then um, the second, I guess, is more of a comment than a question or kind of question. Is, are there any, and I know you only have two meetings, are there any proposals? Um, which of the proposals have the broadest base? If we're talking about paying for city services, those are used by everybody. So rather than targeting just this segment of sale, whether it's business or this or whatever, um, what's being discussed in terms of the base? So the, the target, the, the, the dollar figure is 15 million now uh, that they're going for. And then the, the, the base is, it's been anywhere they think they can generate revenue. You know, it hasn't been, there, one comment was, you know, when the employee paid payroll tax came out, one of the comments was, well, I thought that minimum wage was, was the, the, the Mendoza line should be higher, right? So maybe it's $50,000. Right. So if you make less than fifty thousand dollars, you're not subject to it. So that's been something that's been thrown out. Right. But the base of they, they want to collect as much money from wherever they can. Bill, sure. thanks for a certain and you know, an meeting that you can know. <laughs> uh, it, 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 when Kulagoski was governor, he brought in a bunch of people on how to do budgeting with the state business. What have you? The first thing you do with uh, budgeting is look at the return on investment to see what the return on investment is. What means about the dollars? Did any of that attitude talk about? Well, not yet, but it's in here, yeah. right? It, well, it talks about you know the the cost to implement some of these. Like one of them was putting up more traffic lights for you know speed traps and red lights. And okay, well, what does it cost to implement that? How, what is the ROI going to be on that? So. We got this the last 10, 15 minutes of the last meeting. Um, so, you know, it, they, they, you know, estimated political complexity of everything in here. And that's listed as well from high, medium, low, extremely high. Um, so while we haven't talked about it yet, it's on the radar that they put together. I, I bet next meeting we'll dive into that farther. Sure. So it's, it's just about creating new revenue sources, not about editing potential uh Right. Programs exist. Unfortunately, yeah, right, because we haven't we haven't got the the budget committee and the revenue task force to speak at all together. Um, and they, they, from near as I can tell, they don't really want that to happen. Um, but no, it's not about cutting; it's about generating revenue. Julie, do you know where the fifteen million dollar figure came from? Moss Adams. <laughs> 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 I thought we were up to 29 or 23. Yes, so we, we were. Okay. We were. Oh, you're exactly. No, we were. Yes. So is there a plan at some point for Revenue Task Force to meet with the budget committee? I asked the very first meeting that we do that. Um, and Moss Adams, who is facilitating all this, they weren't opposed to it. Um, and we haven't got there yet. So I, I don't know that we will. I think that it seems like the budget committee uh their timeline is shorter than ours i think we have six meetings maybe seven um so ho i hopefully so how so the city will give the information from the revenue task force to the budget committee so no it'll go to city councilors so same time i've worked with the city on the they always uh, we need to put together our scoring criteria. Has there been a discussion about uh, about putting together a, a grading or scoring criteria once at the end of the day you've got these five different proposals and you're going to score them based on this criteria? There hasn't there hasn't been yet. Okay, I'm sure there will be, but not yet. Okay.
I just received a text from someone online that basically was saying, made a comment that um, for the 15 million, they should, the, the city should consider selling the parking garages. Uh, and there, the 15 million was the comment. I thought I'd share it because they're not able to get comments on the zoom. Apparently not that that's a question, but trying to monitor that. Hey, that that's something I could take back. I think it's yep. probably a good idea. Yeah. So, like, I'm somebody who's interested in buying one to the Liberty Plaza. Okay. All right. What you willing to pay? <laughs> to you, man. Start bidding right now. <laughs> Rich? Bill, is there anything that we or I can do for you to help you in your Um. Well, with, with the Revenue Task Force specifically, no. I think overall, um, we need to elect different people. That's what I would suggest. Bill, when is this supposed to be wrapped up? I don't know the exact timeline. It's supposed to be June with the possibility of going into uh, July or August. The goal is to get done with this before everyone goes on summer vacations. Uh, but I, I can tell you this, from, from the, the people that I'm on this task force with, that they are committed and willing to stay as long as they need to to get the job done. So it'll probably be good to have Bill come back at some point um, when we get a little bit more meat on the boat. Oh, sorry, please. Uh, so it seems like at one point during the Revenue Task Force, they kind of presented um, the level of which, I guess, of service phase of mine. You go to like the stream world, you can kind of go wherever and that's spread. But I know you said that right now they're at 15 million or so. Is that, a, is that kind of the number that Moss, Moss Adams took out of that? Or is that just each individual revenue task force kind of has their own piece of that to spread? No, I think right now that's the 15 million is the overall goal. And I think that, you know, to Julie's point, that is reduced. I, I, I believe after another local accounting firm looked at the numbers, met with the city, and I think that number was, was dwindled down a little bit. But to your point, a gentleman by the name of Bill Smaldone, who's also on the Revenue Task Force, he he suggested at the last meeting that we go above and beyond to try to get the city back to services that were available 20 years ago. Um, pretty lofty goal, and maybe not a bad one, but uh, sounds expensive. Did he by chance mention what those services would be that we're not receiving now? He did not. That I remember. How will how will the uh, committee make the decision based on like a democratic vote or uh, yeah like it, it will be yeah okay. I know that's exactly how it will be yeah we adopted Robert's rules the first meeting it, it, it's being conducted that way. Brenda, did you have a question? You looked right at me. Our eyes connected soulfully, and I thought he must have. A <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask the question now. <laughs> no, no pressure, no pressure. All right, well, with that, unless there's additional questions for Bill, Bill, thank you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Just one Julie? comment. The Citizens Budget Committee uh, is part of the budget committee, right? Sure. And one of those citizens asked the city for four more meetings so we could have more time to do a very difficult job. Um, he was told we could have two more meetings. So now I think we're going to have six total, but it's going to go very fast. Hmm. Copy. Okay. Well, Bill, thank you for volunteering to be a uh, part of that uh, task force. And we look forward to future updates, certainly, as uh, it progresses. So with that, we're going to transition over to Nicole. Um, Nicole's got all kinds of stuff to talk about, I believe, on the recession or for the regarding the short session. I was going to say recession, faux pas. Just twitched at all, right? Yeah, most of the people in this room just twitched when I said that. So, thank you. I appreciate being here and really appreciate the opportunity to represent the chamber. So we are in. I think this will be done today, today or tomorrow. We have to be done by Sunday, but I think we're going to wrap her up today. There's just a few bills left to go. One which I like to call my favorite John Hopkins bill, Federal Reconnect, and it reconnects Oregon's tax code to the federal tax code. Uh, we made it out of last committee last night, going on the floor today in the Senate, and we'll be done. 
patch unanimously, we're on our way. So that's one of the last ones that have to go. The other one is a package of bills. And talking to Jeff the other evening, I realized and I'm often reminded, not everybody lives and breathes this stuff like I do. So I, I thought it was just probably something that I need to get for. But um, so I thought I would just give a quick overview of what it takes to end the session. There are four bills in the budget realm that have to pass at the end of every single session. Now that we have annual sessions, we have them every time. The first one is fee ratification. There's a number of fees in state agencies as business owners, you are well aware of those fees. As they adjust any time, they have to be ratified. And there's, that bill happens every single year now as a part of that because of adjustments made legislatively or they're allowed to move because it changes budgets. That bill has to move. Um, so fee ratification has to go. Capital construction, the bonding bill. So this is using the state's bonding authority to go out to issue bonds to bring in revenue primarily for capital construction. So building projects around the state. So also be used for Connect Oregon. When that comes back around, that's a big bonding package. The state uses whatever percentage of their authority that they want to. Uh, one of my clients is in finance, so we pay very close attention to bonding. We underwrite PERS obligation bonds. We underwrite K-12 capital construction in the state. So we, we watch this a lot. Adjustments are made in that throughout the session. So for this session, there are are a very small handful of new projects that are going to be allowed to access the bonding pool and that revenue. They need to make adjustments to do that, but it happens every session. The big one is budget reconciliation. The author mentioned the Christmas tree bill. <clears throat> the Christmas tree bill is exactly what it sounds like. It's the gifts. In DC, it's the pork that everybody talks about. Love it, hate it, but that's what it is. It's the gimmies. What's interesting is over time, since I started in Oregon to now, the Christmas tree bill has become a lot of state adjustments that didn't used to be that. It used to be all changed now for, for whatever reason. But this is where people are making their ask for different projects around the state to see if, see if they flow. You had heard Representative Anderson talk about on Tuesday that the assailant has some requests. I read, reread, and asked it from people. As far as we see, there is nothing in here but the city assailant. Christmas tree bill, there's nothing in bonding authority, there's nothing in any of the budget bills at all for the city. So, whatever they asked for, they didn't get. Uh, but in Salem, a few things did. The, um, there is a group working on the Vietnam War Memorial, and they asked for a small amount to get them through their first phase. They did get that. Family YMCA did get money for their social service resource center that they're working on in downtown area. And God bless them. Uh, Lamont University got their money for turf uh, on there. When they're working in with a lot of the other Salem youth baseball groups, but they need those from the uh, Grand Fodal out the door. They was this uh, end of session budget bill gives an increase in 2.6 billion in the biennium. 4.9 million general funds, 42 lottery funds, 1.5 other funds, and 646 million in federal funds. And that includes the adjustments to state agencies, as well as, you know, this somewhat, I mean, it's a reasonable list, but list of things that are being given out, you know, as sort of the gifts that happen through the end of the session. Um, the final bill that has to go is the program change bill. So for all, some of these adjustments, you have to change statute in one way or another. For example, budget limitations for state agencies are set forward at the end of last session in all of their budget bills. When those adjust, because they've either been given they've all then pass a bill to make those adjustments in statute. But program change is the last one. So those four bills have to go every session. They're the last ones to move on the floors, except for the signing die bill, which is my favorite bill, which concludes the session. So we, that's right, we cheer for that. We toast each other and we and screaming out the door. Um, so we are waiting for those. These all went out last night. We had a hearing from five to eight o'clock last night. They're heading to the uh, house, let me see. Floor this morning, then they'll have to move straight on into the House floor. Because these are budget bills, they have moved out of their committees and they don't have to have another committee where Reconnect was just a policy bill. We had to do it on the House side and we had to go have another hearing on the Senate side and it has to go to the floor in that direction. These just go straight through and you're out. There's a few other bills that are kind of moving out, came out of uh, Ways and Means last night. So these are, this is the wrap up. It, it's just a matter of timing now to get these you know, just structurally, how they have to move and all the, there's a lot of procedural steps that have to be taken to get through, but we're, we're out today or tomorrow, and that ends it. 
but don't worry. On May, March 12th is filing day. That is the day that you must file to run for office here in the state. A uh, big party day here for candidates because it starts the campaign fundraising season. And one of the big bills that just passed is finance for campaign finance reform. I have not dug into it yet, nor notified my clients how it may or may not change how we choose to invest in candidates. But it is um, it is a change. I think both, both sides held their nose a little bit and made the changes to avoid a ballot measure or a variety of ballot measures that were going to be far more difficult and very restrictive. As many know, Oregon has the, uh, right now, um, right up to this moment, has the least restrictive campaign finance laws in the country. This bill doesn't take effect for two years, so we're still going to be rocking and rolling for two more years. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that works. As legislators literally will start calling me within an hour of the session to just start getting from um, one of my good friends said, I hope I hope they're this nice when we're in session. We'll find out. Uh, we will come back in the interim. We have interim legislative committee days. That schedule has been announced. We come back in May, September, and December. We file bills early September, going early this year. That's pre-session filing. And there will be another opportunity because we'll have new legislators coming in to be able to file bills. But we try to get ours in for our clients early. We want to get them in. There are no limits on the number of bills that can be filed for the long session. So whereas we had about 288 bills this session, we'll have about 3,500 in the long session. So that's always exciting and a lot of good reading. Um, but we're going to get on our way, you know, for all you know, my clients, we're going to meet next week to start to get ready for the bill that we want to file and start working with legislators for that. So, you know, my my message to the chamber and your leadership is to start thinking about where you want to lean in. You know, there's a lot of a lot of places to lean in and um, things that are significantly important. We will have a variety of new legislators coming in. So there'll be a significant amount of education that will happen after we hit the election and know who that is, as well as weighing in with candidates to, to decide where support should be. And, you know, from the chamber side, who you want to support and who makes sense, because we are, we are going to have quite a shift in um, legislators who are going to be coming back this session. But with that, I'm happy to answer questions or if there's something, Tom and Lena, you'd like me to cover specifically, I'm happy to do that. You can tell my voice clearly at the end of session. We're on our way out the door. Cole, could you just jump in a little bit more into the, the budget reconciliation, aka Christmas tree bill? When I saw that, that's public record, is that correct? Yeah. When I saw that, I'm a bit of a nerd. I converted it to an Excel spreadsheet. Wanted to see the total numbers per column. It's done. Two, two, two point five, eight, one billion um, really blew me away, frankly. But in fairness, I've heard of these things. I've not really tracked them. I didn't, not really fully understood those dollars. Can you put into a little bit more context? When, when I see a number like that, I think, whoa, what's going on? Especially when you see some of those line items like DHS asks for $87 million uh, as an example for something that I don't even know what that is. Okay. And um, sure. so can you put a little bit of context to that? Um, absolutely, it is a big number. It's always a big number. And this is a short session, the long session will be twice as big. Um, but it is a blend of funds. So I'll use it as an example. One of my clients, our area agencies on aging. Well, our member here is Union and Disability Services serving Mary Polk, Lots of Yam Hill, Tillamook counties. We had a $17 million investment <laughs> Half of that is general fund and half of it is federal match. We got it. So we got all 17 million. But when you look at the dollars, only eight of that is actually state general fund coming from state coffers. The other half comes from the federal government by Medicaid match. In the cases of DHS and the health authority, that's usually the case. With some exceptions, it's primarily almost all match dollars because they don't really just like to give general funds. Once in a while they will, you know, we have a couple of programs that are general funded. So to give it a little context, out of that 2.6 billion, 409 million is general fund, just state dollars, state your tax dollars right there. So I am not a swift enough petition to do what that percentage is. I'm like, I can see it in my head, the equation, but I can't do it. Um, 42 million is lottery funds. So again, lottery funds, dedicated revenue source here in the state. They can only go to certain things, but out of those, they can you know, move it around in those areas. So 42 of that was it. 
the 646 million of federal funds, those are all federal dollars coming back, still your tax dollars, but coming out, most federal match, a lot of Department of Transportation, a lot of Health Authority, a lot of Department of Human Services. So those are kind of the big areas that you see that, not so much economic development, some of those areas, and education. There's a lot that comes there for education. Um, so, you know, it, it breaks out in those kind of buckets that way. So it, it's a big number. I mean, don't, don't, don't let me take anything away from that. But it, it does break out kind of in those buckets a little bit to give you a little context on how those dollars move. Yeah, I, I think uh, just for everyone's edification on there, I, I would encourage you to look at it. There's some things in there that are really interesting to me. There was one for, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but I think it was Washington County was going needed another $5 million to continue their rehab of the courthouse, mm -hmm. which seems interesting to me because... I've always considered it that's local tax dollars that we've all that they've paid into from Washington County, and it doesn't seem like it's managed well. So again, can you help me sure. put it into context? Courthouses, like just from working on the finance side, are generally funded on that capital construction and the bonding bill. And one thing we noticed from my client's perspective is there was a lot of general fund going to courthouses, and we don't ever see that. We're actually digging into it right now from you know from our our interest in it, that, that that usually does come from the bonding package and from bonding revenue. So that's an anomaly we haven't seen before. I'm actually digging into it a little bit to find out what that means. And when I find out, I'll let you know, but that's unusual. A lot of these things, so the festival, the, symphony, the art museum, the veterinary program at Oregon State, um, Old Town Development, contemporary art, you know, different things like that. They're they're a function of a lobbying. You know, these are the art programs have been really pushing hard, and they have a champion and representative Rob Nose from Portland around their struggle to continue after the pandemic. You know, we were stunned last session when we saw that and kind of the, the broad array of needs, and we're like, you know, I love the arts, huge fan, love it, but like really, like, really where we want to put our money. But you know, it 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 very much is a function of who's heard the loudest and the most. So for my area agencies, we started in June on this to get our money. And we've been, you know, working very diligently. And, you know, that's, you know, each of these groups have either, you know, developed a coalition or worked individually or found their champions. And, you know, we stay right on it. You know, we're, we do all of our work so we know that we can do that. But it, it's just a matter of voice, you know, who's heard, who's heard loudest. Yeah, that's really interesting. Dick? Yeah, you're, you're talking about access to pure um, but yeah, it moves forward again, it moves forward out. So it's important for you to like. Mm -hmm. I want to say, Nicole, great, great job to work on that. That one uh, dollar amount that is for the station insurance. It's an important project. Thank you. Beneficial. And I know the Y has put a lot of time and effort into that. Oh. The um, decision to best any FERS retirement into fossil fuel related industries um, is on its surface, I think we all understand the want to maybe feel like we're impacting climate change and not doing that. Um, with the, that sheer amount of money that needs to be in the market and a guaranteed return, doesn't that put the state in, in just that much more compounded, challenging situation to now be dictating how markets work? And we would say, yes, speaking from my first obligation bonds, who really like it, and people pay back their first obligation bonds. Um, yeah, we think that it's important to, to trust the experts. You know, I trust John Hawkins doing my taxes. God knows I shouldn't do them. Um, you know, I mean, you trust the experts to do the job for you. And that's, you know, that's the same thing when it comes to the investment pool. But investment pools have become very political. And, you know, you have Representative Confom from Southeast Portland. Mm -hmm. And is extremely progressive. She's going over to the Senate. She'll take Michael Dembrow's seat and walk. It'll be very easy. And, you know, she was on revenue for a while, which is frankly disastrous. But um, then John remembers that, that period of time. We just talked about it before hearings a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, has just a very focused, dedicated agenda and is able to move this one through. I think what's even been more damaging to that purse is the bill that they passed, 4045. So 4045 allows 
the um, lowering of the age for retirement for firefighters and police officers, not a huge bump. But the second piece of it is, and that's where they're developing a new hazardous classification. And they will add, for example, workers from the state hospital. They will, um, you know, people who are considered in a hazardous job, which is yet to be somewhat defined. And that's going to have a tremendous bump in the entirety, you know, in the entire level of what the current first obligation is. So much so that in, we never see this, and my clients were losing it all over the place, that the legislative fiscal office who determines how much are these bills going to cost. Every bill has to have a fiscal and a revenue statement. How much will it, will it cost? Said indeterminate. We don't know. We can't figure it out. We can't actually give you a number of how this is going to impact the state's current FERS obligation, but we're gonna pass the bill anyway. And they did, done and gone. And that is going to have a significant impact on the obligation. Certainly not taking anything away from the people who work in those positions, which I'm sure are extremely challenging. They also added DAs and they added forensic scientists. A lot of common conversation about that, but like you all kind of think about that in your head um, compared to firefighters and police officers. But um, this, but the development of this new hazardous category will include 911 operators, you know, is, is going to be significant. And, you know, my client will is doing the math right now, you know, because we operate in this area and kind of starting to figure out, you know, it's just going to, it's going to add more fuel to that obligation fire that all local jurisdictions are liable for. There's no way around it. If you don't get out of it, you have to pay it. Up to the detriment of budgets all over. Please. Nicole, I think you touched on the appropriations bill. Was there anything Salem specific in the capital construction bill that you had a chance to read through? No, just the YFCA because they're getting their funding through um, bond. Through bond. Sorry to say. And that's unfortunate because that's the second time the city has been shut out. Any other questions for Nicole? Something might pop back up as we continue this process. Teachers might want to be included in uh, that risk at risk because some of the teachers are dealing with some things that I'm sure you can talk about. But the teachers are already in first. I know, but I mean, for oh, the, the high risk category, the high risk because there's a lot of weird things going on in some of these schools. It seems there definitely are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. With that segue, which was terrible, really <laughs> <laughs> terrible segue, and I likely will not be sitting up here ever again <laughs> after that. So, thank you, everybody. I would like to turn it over to Andrea uh, to talk about Salem County School District. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was very cheery. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, this this morning actually has just been so cheery in general. Uh, so first of all, I'm so happy to be here with all of you, and um, you know I have a ton of notes. So it's been extremely educational just sitting up here on this panel. I realized, uh, Jeff and I were chatting, I realized I think it's been almost exactly a year since I was here just being introduced, which is amazing to me that a year has already flown by. And I occasionally get the question, um, is this what you expected? Mm -hmm. And I can't really say it's what I expected, but I can say that I am just as joyful and grateful today as I was whatever, 360 days ago or whatever it was that I was here with you guys last time. Um, there are a lot of great things going on schools. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the harder things today. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you my favorite kid story from this week. So I was in a third grade classroom. I walked in and this table looked up and this girl goes, wow, you look just like my mom, but you're way plumper. Oh. <laughs> and my favorite part about this is like plumper. Why don't we use that word? There's yeah. just something funny about that word. You're like, no, no, it just doesn't work grammatically. But anyway, conceptually, I definitely got her point. <laughs> um, so I think this is obviously a energetic and rigorous room. So I'm gonna leave most of my time for questions. Uh, but I'll tee up a few big topics and we can just kind of move around within. Um, so I think maybe just kind of traveling in the wake of the um, Christmas tree conversation, 
I don't believe I need to scrutinize those pages to know that Salem Kaiser Public Schools is not on the list. Uh, so I'll tee up a few things about where we are and then hand it over to you all. Um, the budget situation is certainly complicated. I've leaned in to learn it as fast as I can, and I'll, I'll give you guys a few highlights. Um, we, starting July 1st, we did, we took some pretty draconian measures uh, because we could see a significant cliff. And it's a function of a lot of things, but, you know, we, we in the first six months did um, almost $40 million in adjustments and reductions. Um, in addition to hiring freezes, freezing all elective spending, trying to keep our eye on this ROI question because it is actually very dangerous for school districts to try to cut their way, mm -hmm. just cut their way out of a problem. Um, it's easy to go hard on cost reduction and then start sliding down the grade where parents start leaving the system because you cut the things that families value most. So you have to really keep an eye on the kind of um, optics and the politics in addition to the expense side. Um, we still have another at least 32 million to cut from our from next year's budget over the next about eight weeks. And we have been trying to, using the most pleasing chime and artful bell, ring the alarm on this mm -hmm. so that people are not surprised. Uh, because it will be, I think, in the range of 5% of our workforce that will be reducing, um, announcing those reductions in April. 5% of the workforce of the second largest employer in the area has implications not just for schools and families, but it has implications generally. And so this will be the largest reduction in over a decade. Um, and we're going to handle it the very best we can. Um, the most common question I get right here is, how did this happen? And um, there's a lot of answers, but I'm going to give you three very brief ones. The first is that the way that the state decides how much schools are going to cost to run is really faulty. So, for example, um, the state estimated that the that school districts personnel costs over this biennium were going to increase a little over five percent combined. Five, a little over 5% combined personnel cost increase. Um, by the time this is all said and done, we're gonna be over 14%. And 90% of our operating budget is people. So there's tens of millions of dollars in error just in projection errors happening in state. One of the lines on this sheet might be adjustments that the state made when they shorted themselves and their personnel expenses went up. But the difference is they print the money. So when they're wrong, they figure out a way to solve that problem themselves. But for school districts, all we can do is lay people off. Um, so there are some pretty grave problems inside that. The, the funding formula is, I would say, as soon as we get out of this bargain and this budget has to be our top priority because there has to be a revenue solution. Um, the revenue solution is the rebound for the district. I consider these reductions sort of the middle chapter. Mm. Um, and then one more thing I'll add is that there's a lot of questions about the federal money we got after COVID. And, you know, it was one-time money. I, you know, did you like let yourself get addicted to the one-time money? And about that, I will just share that we, of course, we knew it was one-time money. And the things that we spent it on, kids and families still have those needs. Yeah. They don't disappear because the money disappears. Um, we have we have significantly reduced our reliance on it, um, but I just wouldn't want people to think that um, you know COVID ended and therefore we you know were able to stop a bunch of services. COVID ended and kids are still struggling, <laughs> families are still struggling, and we're we're still doing our best to keep everyone whole. Um, so I'm going to pause there and we'll spend time on budget questions if you have any of them.
I'll just jump right in. You had mentioned a 5% uh, reduction in workforce. Is that spread out amongst teachers, IAs, you know, admin, things of that nature? Mm -hmm. um, so we are 6,000 employees, a little bit less, like 5,800. And there are 60 supervisors for 6,000 employees. Um, so 1% of our workforce is um, <clears throat> supervisory. And I only say this because you may hear, you may have already heard, cut from the top first. And we will, but that number is too small <clears throat> to find a, a, make a significant dent in $32 million in reductions. There's just not enough of us. Um, so as a like a kind of an analog, there would have to be 20 fully staffed superintendent's offices, 20 superintendents, 40 deputies, like that's how many people we would have to have at the top. Um, and we don't have that many people at the top. So the reduction is gonna be spread across all of them, but the shape of our workforce is like this. Almost everyone is in schools. Um, it's um, a, it's an interesting and complicated um, fiscal and political dance right now um, because we are at the bargaining table too. And so what's happening is that um, if you think back to the last R word that happened, you know, especially in right, right around 2008, um, what happened is that the associations partnered with management and collectively, they took furlough days, they forewent colas, and they rode it out together. That's how they reduced the reduction in force. We're just in a really different labor moment right now. Um, and so we're, we've already offered for, for our licensed association, which we are still bargaining with. Um, we mediated last night until almost 11 and um, their counter proposal at 11 last night was still a 6.75 COLA for next year and a four for the year after that. Those numbers are just driving this riff up now um, because at scale, each 1% COLA is another $5 million and that compounds every year. It's not 5 million a year, it's 5 million the first year. And then the next year it compounds. And that's what happens when 90% of your operating budget is people. It's the compounding costs that kill you over time. And when the state is so wrong about personnel increases, what you've got is a compounding workforce of 6,000 people and state revenue that is going the other direction. Um, so yes, it'll be spread. Um, I can't say it's spread proportionately because there's a lot of intervening state law that says who and how and when that um, make this a, a little bit more of a thicket. Dick? I think a description on, on, on the formula on, on cutting. I happened to be at a Rotary meeting yesterday that had a hundred third and fourth graders singing for 45 minutes and they were so disciplined. I mean, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. And there's that young gal that was a teacher, she's 31 years old, she's probably the best one in the whole United States, elementary school music teacher, as an example. And she's gonna be, so do you have a box that you have for the formula, of everyone's treated the same, or do you have any discretion at all that you can say, but here's the proof of an excellent teacher. But, Do you have any discretion at all, or just if you're, if you're there for three years or five years, you're out? I feel like the business community will just get up and walk out of the room when I tell you how we did this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's entirely governed by state law and contracts. Mm. Um, so let's imagine your person. Let's imagine actually a situation we, we hypothetical entirely. Um, where we say we're going to eliminate 100 elementary school teachers. Um, first, we say, all right, we're going to eliminate the least senior of all elementary school teachers. And then there's 100 people who are the least senior. But those people might be more senior than someone else in a different role, and they happen to be qualified. 
So those hundred people filter laterally and take any role from anyone else they can displace. So maybe 10 of those hundred happen to have a middle school endorsement. Then they filter laterally and a different hundred people settle through and you keep doing it until eventually a very different hundred people. Can you describe would be the bankruptcy or um, we have no control, almost no control over the who. And it is very difficult for us to even project the ultimate savings of the who mm -hmm. because of difference in our salary schedules. Um, so at the very like kind of opening level, we've got $47,000. Um, our highest paid teachers are right around 100 so you can see how many pieces move behind the scenes to do a 5% workforce reduction um, and why it is so urgent that even if we are striking, the worst possible conditions for this, even if we are striking, we must move this workforce reduction forward. We cannot wait anymore. We cannot wait because if we wait, we will not leave time for this reduction in force and then the school year will close and people will not know if they have jobs, where they have jobs. Principals won't know who are on their teams. We cannot let that happen. So we're charging forward on two simultaneous fronts, things that the general rules of biology in the universe should never allow to touch, which is a workforce reduction and a teacher strike. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Thank you for being here. So what would that look like? I know that Representative Kramer has really worked on um, the money following the kiddos and maybe those teachers going somewhere else. What would that look like on your budget? If, if that, if with the children and the money was taken from the school district, would that just even have a take more with money following the children? Do you mean if students left our system mm -hmm. and like went to private, they able to go to private, private school? Um, well, our state funding is attached to enrollment. Um, I would say at this point, loosely tethered to enrollment. So it is far from as literal as the money follows the student. Or uh, other states, I just wondered like, what their budget looks like. The in, in terms of like the states where the money was kind of loosely tethered, but where the money they can choose the school they go to. Yeah, these are alligator filled waters right now that we're in. It might look calm on the surface, but the underlying question nationally is really about vouchers. Um, and we'll save that for a different cheery day. Um, we are not in that situation in Oregon. And I'll only say that going down that road is to truly give up hope on public education. Tom, and then oh, Rich. Rich. Uh, other than Moss Adams, is, have they, the school district ever hired a consultant to look at privatizing all of the general services? The, well, I've seen a huge growth over the last you know, five to 10 years of you know, expanding what we do in managing buses, what we do expanding the landscape, what we do maintenance, what we do with building maintenance, what we do, even the construction division is. You know, um, I don't know how much Salem Kaiser has looked in that the previous district that I was in. Uh, I probably wouldn't use the word privatized, but we did outsource um, meal service. Um, we outsourced all building maintenance, custodial services, grounds, all of that was outsourced. And I don't know that it typically results for a school system in significant savings. It is the magic of the partnership. Um, and it's largely because those folks, and for everyone who has kids in schools or has had kids in schools, they are so much part of the school community. Like the, the custodian is very much a person in the lives of our children. Um, the grounds crews even, like they're, they're figures in students' lives, definitely true with transportation. Mm -hmm. And so we really do try to keep it a community and treat the community as something that we want to be stable from a workforce perspective. And also there for our kids, the further we get into outsourcing, the less control we have in cultivating that sense of 
wholeness in a building. Tom? You've really done uh, a profound job on explaining where the district is at very good times, Andrea, and I hope you know that this business community really likes how clear you communicated. Um, and this is obviously a group that's, you know, who you work for, but your board team has not really been at the front or visual or verbal at all during this labor, escalating labor situation. Is there a role that you feel the board could be doing? And I know this is sensitive because you work in the it has been a little bit of a disconnect for us in the public that the board has not been verbal and visual on this crisis, but it, it just kind of had you be the only point person on this. I didn't expect this question, Tom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but well, if it puts you in an awkward spot, no, no, I, I kind of love awkward questions are sort of my favorite. It's the time when everyone in the room is like, oh, wait, I do actually want to hear the answer to yeah. this one. <laughs> Um, all right, so two answers to that. Um, first is, um, we, as a board team, we are spending hours together every week to stay tight. Um, I feel incredibly grateful for the behind the scenes tightness that is not what you guys can see every day. In order for a board to prepare for a strike, they need to feel informed, confident, certain, and most of all, courageous and ready because the amount of pressure that a board receives during something like a build up to a strike is tremendous. Um, so the first and most important answer is that. The second one, I mean, the most interesting and honest answer is I am a first time superintendent. And I think I might look back on this later and say, I didn't ask for enough help. Like, I think I might realize that that was a, uh, a strategic error on my part. Um, the way that I've come to speak so much about it is mostly derived from my sense of urgency. Like I'll perceive a moment, I'll be like, we have to get a message out today. Something happened, we have to say something today. And that's how quickly the internal politics of this moment shift. And then maybe I fall too much into the trap of trusting myself most. Um, I know that I can turn that message that fast. I know that I can make sure that it's accurate. I don't know that I can wrangle seven people with busy lives and busy schedules into the same space and do the same thing. So this may prove to be a now surprisingly public lesson in leadership for me. We'll find out. Well, you've done a really good job. I do want to underscore that. Could you also give us an update on, uh, with Os Os Aldo Javier stepping down, where we're at in the replacement process for him? Sure. Um, we will um, fill that seat on Tuesday. We have five applicants. Dick, oh, sorry. Please, and we'll go to Dick next, yeah. This may be an ignorant question, but huh? thank you for all that you do and leadership. You're amazing. What about the corporate activity tax? All of the business community was sold the line and the corporate activity tax was put into play and by the legislature that this was going to fill the gap for schools and it was going to even out funding for schools and it was going to help. it was going to be the savior. I don't hear that from you and I haven't heard it from you in the times I've heard you present. So how did how did the legislative body miss that? I mean, I, and you probably can't answer that. Maybe this is the Nicole question, or maybe we as the lobby need to get back in and have more conversations. Although my client obviously isn't in the school space, but it, we really did miss it, right? That's what you're saying. Um, well, you can probably help me because there's going to be technicalities. I don't know. Um, I get this question a lot, and I also get um, lottery, and. I'm guessing what happens is that when you all, we are all are sold on a certain tax, it's simplified to a point that people say, schools are gonna get this money. But by the time it actually works its way through the system, the names change, the process changes, 
a lot of rules get attached that were either necessary concessions or passion projects for individual legislators. So the, by the time it comes to us, it looks pretty different, I think, than the way it was described to you all. Um, and so with this one, I believe what this one became is SIA. Is that correct? Um, so when it, it, yeah, when it was passed, uh, you can actually read the language, but it's very specific. It isn't allowed technically to be used broad based. So the superintendent cannot use this money just to fill her budget gap. It's not allowed for that. It is a, it has a kind of a broad number of criteria, and it's supposed to be for improvement in certain areas or you know schools that have a specific higher population of you know students who perhaps are homeless or things there's a whole list of criteria as the superintendent is pointing out that kind of flew a little by the wayside during covid because the cat tax you're right it is for more money john and i have sat through many hearings than they ever expected yes. i mean it is unbelievable it how is. much it's bringing in there's yes. a, an adjustment in here for yes. cat tax mm -hmm. But um, it does have a lot of strengths. Some of those went away, good news or bad, those strings are about to come back because there's been such an uproar legislatively from constituents that say, wait, I voted yes for this and I want my reports. You know, I wanna know where all this is being used and it's being used very specifically to the areas in which it was intended, but it was never a general purpose type of appropriation at all. And those strings are about to come back. The dilemma that politicians face is that people, generally speaking, don't love the idea of just endless demand of public education for more money, but not seeing results. Like they, they I understand this. I, it's not mysterious to me. Okay, you want hundreds and hundreds of millions more? Let's see some results. And so what ends up happening is this money gets a bunch of strings attached and it gets put into these categorical funds. That's how the deal gets made. Unfortunately, by the time it comes to us, the categorical funds don't solve our problems. And sometimes they make our problems worse because they force spending in areas. We don't want, of course, we're gonna take the money, but we spend the money in areas that might not be our most urgent because that's what they said the money was for. At the same time, gaping holes open up on the general side and there's no money for that. And that's how we end up being this sort of like, that's old amoeba that is like got a big donut hole in the middle, but then has got, you know, kind of what I would describe as more boutique funding, like summer, like summer programming. Summer programming is great. But what I'd really like is not to have a 5% reduction in our core workforce. Mm -hmm. So these are, I think, some of the unintended consequences of large initiatives. I gotta give you some advice since I'm one of the older guys. Don't do that McMinnville did. About 30 years ago, they went through just this process, and when they went on strike, they hired other people to come in. The town still talks about it. It divided the town right down the middle. So, so Captain had to go to on strike to shut the schools down. Um. <laughs> Um, it's okay. So I already have a, a little hashtag written on my whiteboard that says don't be Portland. And now I can also add and also McMinnville. Yeah. Um, the, so quick update on strike. Um, I still think a strike is more, more likely than unlikely. Um, we, though we mediated yesterday and did make progress. I, have to just be practical about the signs and the signs are that they intend to strike if that happens we will shut down schools um not only politically is it um brave bordering on foolhardy to try to keep them open i actually don't think it's safe for kids to try to keep them open uh so the most probable earliest date will be that our students will not come back from spring break so that would be the first week in April, if that's the direction we go. Um, we will not operate schools. Um, we will do our best to keep OSAA functions running. Um, in many cases, our coaches are also our licensed staff. And 
although this is a line that if we end up here is going to be very hard for all of us to enforce, we, we just have to have a clean line. We either are running our schools or we are not. Mm -hmm. But what we can't do is we're not open for school, but we're open for all of these other functions. Um, so it, it um, from an athletic perspective, is not the worst possible time, but from a music perspective, it's pretty devastating. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the sticking point on the FTE. Yeah. Boy, I'm going to tell you all, I'm still in awe that this, this, this thing called definition of FTE is the size that it is. Um, true awe. When it was first coming up, I, I treated it like an important technicality because it is technical. Um, boy, I... I want you guys to have experience with me, so I'm not going to get into the details. Here's what I will share on it. Um, we have 6,000 employees, and we need a method to know what percentage time you work. Mm -hmm. um, everyone here who has employees has to have a method of measuring what percentage time. Are you a full-time employee? Are you a 0.6? Are you a 0.9? Are you a 0.873? So you, in order to have a fraction, you have to have a numerator and you have to have a denominator. And from our perspective, this has been such an obvious thing that for years, no, not in the contract, nobody talks about it. The numerator is the amount of time you work. The denominator is the amount of time a full-time person would work measured on a 40-hour week. <laughs> Minutes are stable, they are common across groups, they are common across 6,000 employees. It was literally such a straightforward thing that it didn't exist in the contract at all. For a series of reasons, some of which are very legitimate, but for a series of reasons that are spectacularly uh, theatrical and idiosyncratic, the push right now is to have the denominator be a standard defined as workload. I don't know how we would ever do this. That's 6,000 people with different denominators. How would we run payroll? How would we budget and forecast? You could be an orchestra teacher in one place with a different workload than an orchestra teacher in another place. It, it is organizationally impossible to have the denominator on a standard unit of measure be a non-standard unit. Um, and so, and this is literally what I said at the bargaining table, we find ourselves in an odd situation, which is we are in a knife fight over our radical agreement that whatever we used to do always worked. Mm -hmm. There are things that are hard to figure out at the bargaining table. This is something adults figure out at the bargaining table because it has just gotten into this crazy knotted mess and it just needs the patience and the stamina of a few people sitting down, unraveling the whole thing and putting it back together again. We made a lot of progress last night. Sorry, that was probably a more loaded question. <laughs> or did I seem triggered? <laughs> <laughs> This might be a little early, you know, unknowns, but what do you anticipate this just workforce course reduction meaning for the experience that average student would have to mm. This is the most fair question that people are asking, teachers are asking, parents are asking, students are asking. And I think when most people ask it, they, they want to know what, what about my specific life is going to be different. That's hard for the crazy reduction reason I described earlier. And also because we haven't finished figuring out how we're going to get to 32 million. But here's the best general answer. There are going to be fewer adults serving the same number of students. Mm -hmm. The reason that we are struggling so much at the bargaining table with class size is ratio is going to go up next year. It is the only possible end result of a workforce reduction at this scope. Um, 
And that means that jobs are harder. And jobs are hard enough right now, which is why I sure as heck feel like this funding formula reform is the long-term solution to a what I hope is a short-term moment of harm. I just saw you guys, you also uh, made, um, what did you say? Longing eyes at each other, which makes me soulful, think I'm out of time. Soulful. Soulful, soulful eyes gaze, at each yeah. other, yes. Yeah, and I apologize. We have two questions. We do we do need to do one with the presentation. Um, maybe the two of you can give your question to uh, Lena or Tom, and then that could be presented. Uh, to Andrea, and then Andrea can get back to the group if that's okay. Apologies. Andrea did go a lot longer than what expected or allotted, so that's really great. Frankly, I feel like we could do a whole session just with Andrea having a conversation on the school district. It's such an important, vital part of the community and how it affects not just kids. I mean, I don't want to I'll get off the... Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'd uh, like to turn it over to uh, Jimmy Jones with uh, Community Action Agency uh, to talk about his programs and the programs that they're providing for the community. So with that, Jimmy. Thank you, Jeff. I'm very happy to be here today. And we're going to go from that cheery update to when it's much worse um, in terms of the housing future uh, in the state of Oregon. Uh, uh, you may have to adjust your hearing. I'm from the South, uh, not from Eugene, and I've lived here 20 years, and all my friends and family back home said I lost my accent. And I sound like y'all now. Um, I'm skeptical of that a little bit. Um, I wear a lot of different hats statewide. I'm a chair of a couple of statewide task force, uh, especially the hospital discharge task force that's uh, uh, meeting right now. I also organize all the legislative work uh, for the Community Action Network statewide. So that's uh, 18 agency covering all 36 counties of Oregon. Uh, we do a lot of uh, homeless and housing work at the legislature. And my day job, my primary job, the thing that I love the most about the work that I do is I'm the executive director of the Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency. CAAs were created uh, in the mid 1960s, chartered as part of the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964, uh, an instrument of the war on poverty. And the idea was that you were going to take federal resources and bring them into local communities and put them in the hands of nonprofits that were having their work informed by people in poverty, the people that were receiving uh, those services. So we've been around since 1967, an independent nonprofit since 1969. Uh, doing anti-poverty work here in primarily Marion and Polk County, but we also serve other counties as well in certain areas, including Yam Hill and even Multnomah uh, in one program area. Uh, the agency is a, a fairly large nonprofit. We uh, serve around 60,000 people a year, primarily in Marion and Polk. Uh, we provide about $70 million in resources and services into the local community each year, and we employ just a little less than about 600 people. Uh, the agency is divided into three divisions. Uh, the first division is our energy and weatherization program. Uh, energy is essentially uh, financial assistance for people who are struggling with their light, gas, and water bills. Also, we do a few other sort of things in that area. A weatherization program has been around since 1971. Uh, it provides uh, uh, updates to uh, low-income homeowners, uh, insulation, doors, windows, water heaters, those sorts of things ideally to reduce their energy costs so that they can afford uh, to pay their bills and stay in their homes. Uh, the second division is our early learning and child care division. This is um, one of the larger parts of the agency. We run a fairly large Head Start program. We have 835 slots, uh, and uh, that includes a state program, includes a federal program, uh, and uh, you know, we're operating around 32 Head Start sites uh, across both counties. So it's a it's a fairly large program. We also have a training and technical assistance program, CCR and R, uh, ch child care resource and referral. That's basically training and technical assistance for family based child care providers. They go into their homes, they work with those family based child care providers, making sure that they have all of the certifications they need, CPR, other state certifications that they need to safely operate a family based child care. And if you follow the child care uh, conversation for the last couple of years, you know just how grave a situation that that has become in terms of finding child care that's affordable uh, for uh, working populations across the state of Oregon. We run the USDA Nutrition Program. That's a reimbursement program for family-based child care providers, um, uh, taking the federal grant and distributing it to family-based child care providers across 11 counties uh, in Oregon. Um, and they serve on average around 6,000 children a year uh, through that process. 
Uh, and then probably what we're known for most uh, at the moment is our housing and homeless services division. Uh, that's Arches. Uh, that's home youth. Uh, so that is the area that's grown the fastest in recent years. Uh, we especially our sheltering side. So in the last five years ago, we had no shelter beds at all. Uh, today, we uh, operate more than 300 shelter beds in the community. Uh, that's the Arches Inn, which was a turnkey motel property over there on Hawthorne. It used to be over the Super 8 Motel. Uh, we purchased that in 2021. Uh, last year, we purchased uh, the old Capital Inn and Suites on Fisher Road. That's another 74 units. Uh, we turned that into a, a transitional shelter. Uh, that's the Arches Lodge. Uh, that opened in December. Uh, we operate the City of Salem's Navigation Center uh, over on uh, 22nd and, uh, and Mission. Uh, that's another 75 beds. Uh, we operate Taylor's House, which is the region's only overnight shelter for runaway and homeless youth. Serves uh, ages 11 to 17. Uh, we are opening this month, March, yeah, opening this month, another uh, runaway and homeless youth shelter for, the, for a similar population uh, over in Monmouth. Uh, and that's been a labor of love for a lot of us to get that up off the ground and running as well. We operate a veteran shelter. We are going to open a family shelter next year. So the community 10 years ago had less than 300 shelter beds. Uh, in all of Marion and Pope now, we have somewhere close to 1,000 shelter beds. Uh, so that's a lot. And we've only been able to do that because we've been very aggressive in terms of, you know, we know that the city of Salem can't pay for these sorts of things. And the state of Oregon barely can. So we go out and we are very aggressive to try to attract into the agency as many state and federal and private grants as we possibly can. Uh, just recently, you may have read that we received $5 million from Amazon. That's a nationally competitive uh, uh, grant to help uh, solve the family uh, unsheltered crisis in our community. We believe with that $5 million, we're going to be able to house every single unsheltered family uh, that, that that is here in Marion and Polk counties. So, you know, we've, we've grown a lot in terms of, you know, our capacity to be able to do more. Um, the agency operates around 210 grants uh, and a lot of that sort of amoeba like uh, way. Sometimes we get resources for things that uh, are sort of pet projects, I think, sometimes uh, to get done. Uh, but also, you know, in terms of trying to make sure that we have the basic resources that we need to continue operations. That's always a fight uh, year in and year out. Um, Amazon, we're also heavily funded by Kaiser Permanente. Uh, they put millions into our sheltering operations over the years. And as a result of all that, we've been able to do just a lot more work than what we've been able to do in the past. Um, you know, we are housing, rehousing about a thousand homeless people every year. Uh, those are folks who were living on the street last year who are not living on the street today. And the next thing you should say to me is that why, why are there still homeless people outside if you're housing people at that, at that particular rate? The problem is the inflow continues to increase, right? So every time I take one person off the street, one and a half more appear. And I'll talk a little bit more about that phenomenon uh, in just a second. Um, so, you know, even though we're rehousing a huge number of folks, there's still a, a need. That need is not as great as it was three years ago. Everybody remembers the winter of 2019 and winter of 2020. That year, uh, when we had hundreds of people living on the streets in downtown Salem. So if you walk along, you know, behind the right aid area, what used to be Nordstrom over there, other parts of the downtown, what you see is there's virtually nobody there today. That's because they're all in shelters. Uh, now, if you go to the East Salem, you go to Lancaster, uh, that part of town, there's a lot of work over there that still needs to be done. And the homeless population in East Salem has continued uh, to grow. And so we, we've got to do a lot more on that front. We are running one of the largest rental assistance programs to keep people in their homes in the state of Oregon. Since the summer of 2020, uh, we provided more than $42 million. That's a really big number. Uh, for folks who were in danger of losing their homes through an eviction process to more than 6,000 households in Marion uh, in Polk County. So that's, uh, uh, that's been a big lift for us um, across the agency, and we uh, feel pretty good about that work. Uh, if you would ask me 10 years ago if that was a good use of the money, uh, I would have been very skeptical of that because all the research you know, right back around 2014 would tell you that most of those people are going to have to figure out their problems through the rest of the year. Most of those people really wouldn't become homeless. That's not the case here in 2024. Uh, when we're assisting those households, most of those people have no other options and may very well uh, lose their home. So we've kept this rent, uh, homeless problem from being much, much worse here in Salem uh, than it might uh, otherwise have been. I think uh, the, the thing that, that folks really struggle with is why haven't we sort of cleaned all this up already? And the problem is, again, that inflow into the system is, is growing. Um, if you look at the national uh, landscape in terms of the homeless population across the country, 
what you'll see, quite frankly, is that the homeless, the, the size of the homeless population in every state, no matter where it is, is directly correlated to the cost of housing in the community. So as the cost of housing goes up, the rates of homelessness increase. And this is one of the unaffordable places in the country to live on the West Coast uh, in Oregon, because we made certain policy choices in the 1970s to really sort of freeze Oregon in time and make sure that it did not become California. Uh, we've made it incredibly difficult, if not impossible, sometimes uh, to construct homes. Uh, and there's even a lot of tension now between the housing community and the environmental community over where we're going to build, if we're going to be able to build. Uh, we did get a bill uh, through in this most recent session. The two biggest bills in my world were Senate Bill uh, 1537 and 1530. Uh, 1530 was the um, essentially the services component of, of, of the homeless work. And 1537 was uh, the plan to construct more affordable housing and change the, change the urban growth boundary rules that allow uh, cities to uh, bring more territory, more land into the urban growth boundary so that they could construct more homes. The, the problem has become really acute. Uh, so out of the, in the most recent iteration of that uh, rental assistance program, the average rent month, this is a term that we, term of art that we use, the average rent month that we're paying so when somebody comes to us, what is their rent for that month? The average rent month is about $2,050. So this money really isn't going to people who are otherwise in affordable housing complexes on Section 8 vouchers and things of that nature. That money is going to people who are working. Uh, a lot of times they're single moms working at Walmart, bars and restaurants and places like that. The rent costs have increased to a level that it's just no longer affordable for them to stay in their homes. The average two-bedroom apartment in Salem has pushed past $1,500 a month. Uh, and then when you look at whether or not, you know, people can just viably afford that, it's become much more complex. We use these phrases, terms of art called rent burden. That means somebody's paying more than 30% of their income toward their rent or, uh, um, you know, heavily rent burdened. They're paying more than 50%. Those ratios on the West Coast continue to grow dramatically and especially uh, here in Oregon. So those are sort of storm clouds uh, on the front. And, uh, that are going to get worse uh, in years to come. So we have about 20,000 people uh, in Oregon right now that are homeless. That number will continue to increase even with all this money and all these resources and all this work going into the problem because it's largely being driven by economic factors beyond most people's control. And so you can expect that 20,000 to hit 25,000, maybe even 30,000 in the next uh, 10 years. Uh, and if we were to step back, if the city were to step back, if agencies like, like mine were to step back and basically stop uh, providing rental assistance and stop doing the work that they were doing and stop sheltering folks, the size of the homeless population in, in Salem would, would double overnight. Uh, we have, like I said earlier, nearly a thousand people in shelter. If suddenly that went away, uh, what you would see on the downtown streets uh, would be extraordinary. Um, you know, I think that's the, the question that I get more frequently. How long is this going to go on? How long is it going to last? And it's going to last for another generation. It took us 30 years of bad public policy to get here. Uh, it's going to take us a generation to get out of it, but we are making uh, some progress. So I don't want to take up the whole time talking and be glad to uh, answer some questions about the agency or the homeless population or where we're going. Jeff, Jeff you want to pick? Uh, good outcomes of the grant money. And is there a metric of getting houseless people self-sufficient? Yeah. So the two very honest parts of that conversation is that uh, our only goal is getting people into permanent housing. It's not to warehouse folks. We want to take those shelters and turn people over as quickly as we can. Otherwise, it just becomes a warehouse where we're just holding a population and it's incredibly expensive to shelter people. We don't want to do that. Uh, so we're trying to house as many people as we can as fast as we can. We need more units. We need more, obviously, financial support to do that. Uh, self-sufficiency, our agency is geared towards self-sufficiency. The work is geared towards self-sufficiency, but we also have to come to the realization that many of the folks that we're working with are disabled. Uh, a lot of the folks that we're working with will never really work again. It's an older and increasingly older population. Um, you know, so what we do, do try to do is move them off of state resources and onto federal resources like Section 8 housing vouchers, uh, affordable housing projects and things of that nature so that the the, the general fund impact is less than what it otherwise would be. Yep. Thank you yep. for being here. You talked about the new runaway uh, <laughs> shelter in Monmouth. What does that look like um, in regards to a low barrier with the amount of children or youth or even like women that are getting sex trafficked? Like how are we as a society helping those kiddos or are we just giving them 
a tiny house to sleep in. Yeah. Like, what does that resource look like? So those things are licensed. Yeah, those are licensed by DHS and they require heavy programming. Uh, and so everyone who comes into a facility like that is getting all of these secondary supports connected to all of those resources they need to be connected to so that uh, we can work that problem. The goal of, of, of a youth shelter is not to keep them in shelter very long. You know, our goal is to reconnect them with somebody, family any entity that can be able to provide a safe uh, and nurturing home for them. But in certain cases, they may need years of support and substance abuse. They may need years of counseling, mental health services, and those sorts of things. Those services are generally there. The problem is this is disconnecting, getting people connected to them. But so, like, if you kind of like, can we try to, or can we try to get their ID? Or it's just like, if I don't have ID? It's, there's, well, it's not that low barrier. Uh, because we, we, when it comes to minors, we have to have some certain baseline information. A lot of the, the beds are actually filled by DHS. They bring youth to us and say, we don't have a placement for them. Otherwise, we don't want to put them in a motel. We, they, we don't have a foster placement for them. So it's, there's a lot of background information that comes in that process. Yeah. It's not clear. So you mentioned there's about a one to one half ratio, right? For everyone. Yeah. And you have about one half that basically is still on the streets or comes on the streets. You mentioned that the biggest reason for that is our housing affordability and it's continued to rise, which right. implies that people are essentially living here, losing their house, and now they're moving from the streets. Uh, with that being the idea, so are you saying that the average person who finds that you're, you're hoping at this point are people that have lived here for greater than five years, had housing here, and actually lost that housing here, or are they people that have come from other areas or people that never it's both, but in terms of the of the percentages, about 80 to 85 percent of the people that we assist have some connection to the region long term. So uh, I designed the city of Salem's homeless rental assistance program seven years ago, HRAP, they used to call it to run it through the housing authority. And as part of that program, we determined every client's coming in, into that program location of origin, because I wanted to know the answer to that question, too. Um, and 80 to 85 percent uh, were from the region. They may have graduated high school in Silverton, but they ended up here. Uh, they may have lived in Salem, went off to California, but they came back here, those sorts of things. Uh, most of them had a connection to the region that was 10 years or more uh, at that point. Now, we always are going to, because we're sitting on an interstate, you know, we're always going to have a transient population that's coming up and down that interstate. So there are a few people that come into the region, but the lion's share are, are, are friends and family members, people you went to school with, that sort of thing. Um, a little follow-up on that, Jimmy. Myself, Connor Wrighton, and uh, Jonathan Castro participated in the point-in-time count two right. years ago. Um, and there was a question that was not allowed to be asked on the program, because apparently it's like a federal yeah. what could be asked. Yeah. But they're all subjective questions, Here's so I asked it. So we interviewed 61 people during my day, um, and eight had a connection to Salem. Two out of 61 said they were from Salem. And, and I've often heard that, no, these are mostly from Salem. Yeah. That either I had the weirdest mm -hmm. abnormal day experience along yeah. with Connor and, and Jonathan, or I, I just want to get to that fact center, and and it's okay to say a lot of these people are coming from out of the area, but we just need to talk in truth. Yeah, and I, and I have a hard time because Believing I that. wanted to walk those streets. Yeah. I'm not going to go yeah. talk a narrative without doing it. Yeah, when 61 people were asked and two said they were from our area, yeah, I'm not seeing an alignment that these are all from saying. So. Very briefly, because we're running out of time. Um, <laughs> we got all day. Yeah, we got all day. I can give you an all day answer. Yeah, uh, I would be happy to share the database that I have with you. Names removed. It shows the information that I just described. Um, the other thing, you really can't. When you're asking those kinds of questions, you're going to get the answers that they think you want to hear. Sure. And and so you also might say, are you from Salem? And if that's the answer, a lot of them aren't going to be from Salem. They're from Staten or they're from Kaiser or they're from Silverton. And so it depends on how you ask the question as to how you're going to get that response. Or they may have lived here 10 years ago and went away and came back. So um, 
because they have family in the area. Now, there is a phenomenon, you know, places like the state hospital historically are supposed to return people to their county of origin. The state, the state uh, penitentiary is supposed to return people to the county of origin. Uh, people across the state will swear up and down that that happens, but it doesn't. And, you know, or they drift back into the region. Uh, you didn't really have a weird day. That's exactly what the ratio is. I would expect you to get in a, in a, in a set of questions like that. Um, a lot of times we have observer bias, too, as social workers and other people who are encountering the population. Uh, so the police will frequently tell you that there are a large number of people coming into this community from from areas outside of it. And that's because if they see 10 driver's license in one day, they'll remember the one that says Idaho. They'll remember the one that says Texas and Arkansas, but they'll forget the eight that they saw that says Oregon. So a lot of it has to do with the way in which we're processing information when we receive it. Uh, so you talked to 61 people that day. Two of them might have said to from Salem, I'm not surprised by that at all. Uh, but if you look at the macro data over long periods of time, almost all of these folks uh, are from the community. Dick, you had a quick question? Jimmy, if you were the benevolent Dick here, I'm just saying you're a Dick, my hearing, I've lost 80% of my hearing. I grew up on a farm sitting on top of a tractor, so I'm nearly deaf. Uh, say, say it again, Dick, I'm sorry. If you were the benevolent dictator, what would you do to reverse this 30-year problem? If I was a benevolent dictator, <laughs> I may have to be an unbenevolent dictator to get this done. Um, <clears throat> well, so the economic reality to all this, one dimension to that is just um, we don't have enough units to put people in at a low enough cost. Um, even with all the resources that we get, it costs more now than it ever has before to get somebody housed and keep them housed in, in a long, sort of a long-term investment. We have about $15 in resource for every, uh, excuse me, we have about $15 of need for every $1 of resource that we have in the community. That's not the problem. Yeah. How do you reverse the problem? How do you reverse the problem? Yeah, there's 30, year, 30 years of bad trust, right? Yeah. I, so let's look at places where there's not nearly as many homeless folks as there are here, right? Uh, you look at a place like Texas, for example, uh, where the trends are beginning to stabilize and reverse. Um, those are places where, you know, you have much cheaper housing generally. Uh, they have had different philosophies on incarceration around drug crimes. Uh, so some of those people that are outside here wouldn't be outside in a place like Texas because they're locked up because they had drug possession, things of that nature. Um, I also tend to think that you know, in the South where I'm from, you know, I grew up in this very small place. My grandmother lived right next door. My cousin was on the other side of that. My uncle was not far away. So when something went wrong, there was always somebody right there to help. Our society in the last 50 years has abandoned that principle and we're all scattered out all over the place. So it's very difficult to find help when things go wrong because your aunt might live two states away. Your uncle might live, you know, uh, three counties away. Uh, so getting help isn't quite as easy as, as it once was. Uh, so the typical pathway is somebody can't afford their apartment anymore. Increasingly, we, so if you look at, I mean, it's a long answer. Um, if you look at, you know, Oregon's homeless rate grew between 2020 and 2022 by 22.5%. At the same time, the national homeless rate in that era, those two years, grew only 0.3%. So something here is mo way out of whack compared to the rest of the country. In the last year, in 2023, the homeless population grew 12%. But if you look at the demographics inside of that, the, the fastest growing homeless populations were the elderly, were families, and were youth. So we're not doing a good enough job making sure that people at the end of their life have an affordable option. And we're doing a really terrible job in making sure that families have all the resources that they need in the beginning period. With that said, I want to be sensitive to time. It is past time uh, to wrap this up. I know there's a couple of questions, Brandon, I apologize. Uh, if there's questions, I think that you got to just chat with Jimmy. Jimmy, you have a few more minutes to just kind of. Yeah, I can stick around. If you want to ask a question, apologies. Everyone, thank you for being here. And yep. please uh, help me thank those panelists.